Good morning. It's really great to be here. And what I'd like to talk about this morning are design studios, because I see them as really exciting spaces for learning. Here's a pair of pictures that I took of two design studios, uh, architecture and product design. And what you see in these studios are there's the umbrella, the Barbie dolls, the half-made thing, all sorts of work in progress. What's cool about being in a studio is that you get to see this work before anybody else. And so all of the other peers in your class, you get to see those good ideas and how they unfold, because the final product always has you know, a million twists and turns. And when you come to critique, you get to see all of the outcomes of everybody's projects. And so unlike a philosophy class where you might slip a paper under the door, you have no idea what anybody else did. In a design studio, you get a chance to see 17 different responses to the exact same design brief. And what's amazing is that many of those are things that you never thought to do. And you get to see what worked and what didn't and all of that variety. But it's not just in a design studio that you get peer learning. This happens whenever people come together. Um, as an undergraduate, I spent half of my time taking art classes and half of my time taking computer science classes. And I saw the same experience in a computer lab where your code doesn't work. You turn to the person next to you, uh, and you get to see what, what they're doing. They can help you. You get to see what's coming three years down the line when you take more advanced classes. And you build lifelong friendships. And when these computer labs have disappeared as the, the laptop has come along, you know, I think in many ways, uh, the laptop is the most pernicious uh, invention of computer science education because cheap laptops mean that we no longer have these co-located spaces uh, of computer labs. And um, a few years ago, my colleagues and I at Stanford started thinking about putting our classes online. And I teach studio classes. And so we thought about how we might be able to take the, the design studio class and then scale that up to the massive scale of an online class with thousands of students. If we have open-ended work like sketches, what we'd like to be able to do is that students can do anything they want, and we'll get them feedback and be able to help encourage them uh, in their work. Now, how do you do this when you have tens of thousands of students? A lot of design teachers will tell you that, man, you know, teaching 17 students, that's a lot. That's, that's really tough. Uh, so how could you do this for 10,000? And the one thing that scales automatically with uh, all of the students in a, a massive online class is all of the students in the, the massive online class. That's your TEDx tautology this morning. And so what we'd like to do is we're going to have students review each other's work. But the flip side of this tautology is that the reason that there's students in the class is precisely because they don't yet know the material. And so we're going to have people who aren't yet experts being able to provide feedback to each other. Uh, and we draw on a system called calibrated peer review uh, that was introduced to me by my friend Ed Hutchins. And this strategy has students be calibrated on examples of other assignments. And uh, in some ways, and this relates to a talk uh, that we heard earlier in the same session, the practice of seeing lots of examples and of building up your 10,000 hours of expertise, by rating others' work, you acquire the expertise that you need. And here, we're going to do it at a very micro scale. We're not going to get you to be a whole designer, because that takes your, your many thousands of hours. We're going to get you spun up just on a very particular design brief. And we tried this originally in my human-computer interaction class. And then uh, it's since been used in more than 100 other massive online classes by many, many thousands of students. And what's most remarkable for me, what we had no idea when we started out in this, is the diversity of domains that we see students using this. So we have classes in programming in Python. Peer review is great for code. Uh, philosophy, character management, uh, nutrition, take a picture of some food, uh, or of social psychology, or constitutional law, world music. All of these different fields benefit from the ability to have creative open-ended assignments and peer review. And what's surprising to me in many ways is that it, for a pass-fail class like you have with a, with a MOOC, 
this works really well, that um, if we compare the student-provided grades to what we might see from a, a staff-provided grade, uh, things look very favorably. But I think the success of this is not primarily the, the number scale, but the fact that you know, the real learning happens when you see all of the other students work in the class. And so if you have an art class where everybody's in Norway or everybody's in Canada, then you may be all riffing on the same ideas that are around you. But when you have an art class where people are from all over the world, well, you see all of this great different stuff. And the diversity of ideas is, is even larger. And I, we want to figure out how we can find other ways to leverage these diverse perspectives. And uh, students in our initial peer review work were excited to see what came out. They got to participate in a global studio critique. But they didn't yet get to participate in a global studio where, while the work was underway. And so our more recent uh, research, which is led by my PhD student, Chin Michael Carney, is exploring how we can get this diversity more pervasively in a, in a massive online class. And so uh, Chin Mai and my group build this system called Talk About, where students have small group discussions with peers all around the world. Uh, and we worked initially with this social psychology class. Uh, we also, you heard Dan Ariely's ideas this morning. We worked with Dan's class. And what we can do is that you're excited to talk about all of these ideas. We're going to have our morning break in a few minutes. And just like you're going to be able to go out into the hallway and talk about everything that you've heard this morning, um, the students in this class can hop on and they can join a small group of uh, small discussion group. And so this is not a thousand people, it's six people talking about stuff. And we have lots of different discussion groups. Simply participating in these discussion groups actually improves the performance and retention of students in massive online classes. Retention is something that a lot of people are worried about online because it's easy to be alone together. You have a planet full of people, all of whom logged in on a computer terminal, and you have no idea who else is there, and so eventually you drift off. And these discussions help keep people student, uh, they help keep students engaged, and they help students do better in the class. You talk about the ideas, it makes sense. What's really cool for me is that if we compare homogenous discussion groups and diverse discussion groups, the students that are in the diverse discussion groups where uh, the average distance might be 4,000 kilometers between students, uh, they actually do even better than the homogenous discussion groups. And so simply being present to a diverse community of peers, uh, in addition to the intrinsic benefits of that, also improves course performance. And all, all sorts of things happened that were unexpected to us. For example, uh, in the International Women's Health and Human Rights class, 94% of students shared their contact information at the end of the, the discussion. They would say, hey, let's continue the conversation. Everybody, share your emails. Let's keep talking. Um, and as one of the participants explained, you know, we share these emails because we're discussing issues that require a strong networked group to change the status quo, that the, the impact would be far greater if participants could connect and engage you know, outside of the course. And I think as a researcher, this is really interesting to me that um, I, I showed you some examples of Chin Mai's research. 10 years ago, for a PhD student in computer science, it would be very difficult to have this kind of, of global impact during your PhD. And I think this is reflective of a larger change that we see in my field of human-computer interaction, that in the, the desktop computer days, uh, the way that software, human-centered software design worked roughly was that when you got it mostly done, you would drag somebody into your lab, you would have them try your software. When they got stuck and swore, uh, you would write down where that happened, and you would fix the software usability bug. And then when you ran out of money or time, you would release it. And you have no idea what anybody's doing after you release your software. It's a little bit of a caricature, but, but mostly true. Now, in the internet age, it becomes extremely easy 
to release early and often, and to release different versions to different people. So we have the ability to run real experiments where half the people get one, half the people get the other, and we can see the impact. We can also see what happens out in the real world, longitudinal change, all of this. And this, uh, this sea change that, that we're seeing in the field of design, I think about as being you know, the difference between swimming in a swimming pool and then swimming with, with the whole planet out in the ocean. Uh, and this idea I see as, as design at large. In the design lab here at UCSD, uh, and in fact in, in a lot of engineering, uh, we create postcards from the future. So we'll invent some kind of future today. This is a global scale peer discussion. And then we see how that future plays out. And we write postcards back of what it's like to live in that future. That, that's the research enterprise of our design lab. And what's neat is that the, when this works well, uh, the successes of design at large are extremely exciting. Uh, these are some of my former graduate students and, and some of the companies that they've started. And you can see with social media and many other things uh, that we can have a, a real impact. But you know, these, are, these are the successful examples. And um, the challenge is that the failure rate with startups and similar is really high. More than 90% of startups fail by many measures. And the same is true with government software or restaurants or almost any other creative venture that you might think about. I think part of the challenge here is that design is faith-based rather than research-based. And now, with the internet, we have the opportunity to change some of that. In an engineering school, there actually is a real practical theory, but it's built from the physical sciences. And so when the world is based on physics and math, we can offer practical theory. But the human world is different. It's, it's not like that. Um, you know, one challenge is that introspection is really valuable, uh, but it's often wrong, as you've seen already this morning. Uh, and in industry, we've taken inspiration from the strategy of running large-scale experiments. But industry is focused on getting the product right, which is different from building reusable principles that we can give to other people. So what we want to be able to do in our active learning research in the design lab is to be able to build practical theory with these real world experiments, run the real control, share it at the world at global scale, and then bake that theory into software that transforms learning. What, what I didn't realize when I got involved in online education is the fact that because the pedagogy and software are so intertwined, as you tweak one, it automatically cascades to something else. So if I do something neat in my in-class syllabus, nobody else ever might know unless I put it out on the web or they borrow it. But online, as we build, run these experiments and refine the process and come up with best practices and do instructor training, that automatically cascades to everything else. And so it's a really virtuous cycle. Now, doing all this stuff is a really multidisciplinary effort. Uh, when we started the design lab here with Don Norman as our director, uh, we worked very hard to be in a building in place uh, over in Cal IT in Atkinson Hall uh, that's not tied to any particular department. And so we have uh, students and collaborators uh, from all around the university, in fact, from, uh, from the broader San Diego community. And so with that, I'd like to invite all of you to think with me about what are the ways uh, in your, your own work and in your own curiosity that we can take this strategy of design at large, of running real experiments at scale, and using that to build practical theory. Uh, and hopefully, we can use that to transform many fields. Thank you very much.